You stepped into the News Talk studio, uh, and for tw for the best part of almost 20 years, you were one of the biggest names in broadcasting. We talked, again, we talked about it before, but you massively heralded News Talk to a new place. Talk me through the formation of your show, what kind of uh, segments and how you put those segments together, and just your general approach to two hours of live radio every day. Well, you see, the thing is that everybody in radio at the moment uh, it, it has grown up with television. They haven't grown up with radio. They've essentially grown up with television. So therefore, whether they are a broadcaster, researcher, or producer, the thought process, and it, 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 they may not even know that, but, but it's built in, if you like, mm. the thought process is... This is television. We just don't have any pictures. Whereas radio is completely different. Now, when you, when you think of me, I grew up with radio. I didn't see television until I was 21. Mm. So therefore, I had this extraordinary grounding in radio. Broadcasting is when I'm doing more homework at home as a schoolboy. Uh, you invariably listen to BBC because RTE had very limited coverage. I mean, don't forget... RTE had the news at nine o'clock in the morning and then went off the air until lunchtime, then did a couple of lunchtime programs and went off the air mm -hmm. until six o'clock, okay? So you listen to BBC and all these wonderful radio broadcasters, comedians, current affairs people, whatever they were. And I listened to them and I didn't know I was learning, but I was, it's this osmosis. So suddenly I understand radio. So then news talk are, are, are going to open up in in March, April, I think. Definitely March or April, I just can't remember. And like at Christmas time, they have all the slots filled except drive time. And the guy they wanted for drive time wasn't going to be available for a few months. So they said, who do we know who's cheap? <laughs> who can fill in and then say, no, where you try hook? <laughs> so they asked me and I said, sure. Mm. And and uh, then, like after the first year, at the end of the first year, in audience terms, I was delivering more than every other broadcaster on, on, on the day shift. So mm. seven to seven, I was producing something like 55%. Now numbers were very small, mm. but nevertheless, it was 55% of the total. Mm. So then, you know, I got a better contract and happily I got more money and all that sort of good things happened. Mm. So I how I did it was I, I copied all the people I had listened to mm. as kid really and I copied them so for instance one of the great things on the old radio you'd have a comedian and he would talk either about his wife or his mother-in-law now you never heard the mother-in-law or anything uh, but it's the oldest joke in in musical comedy the mother-in-law or her great indoors or she who must be obeyed and used to have all these phrases. So I thought this is a great idea. <laughs> so I invented the lovely Ingrid. Mm. So like nobody had met Ingrid or seen her or knew the first thing about her, but I'm talking about her all the time. <laughs> and then I'm out to dinner or something and people are coming over and saying to her, are you the lovely Ingrid, <laughs> you know? So, and then there was the other one that was, was an amazing broadcaster. He came on after Terry Wogan at 10 o'clock called Jimmy Young. And he had been a pop singer. He, in fact, had two number ones on the UK charts. And he, he used to get this guy on called Tony D'Angelo. It's incredible. I can remember his name 40 mm. years later. And Tony D'Angelo used to talk about vegetables, right? <laughs> and Jimmy would say, now, Tone, he always cut things. That was the other one he did. Like, it was never the Jimmy Young show. It was the JY show. <laughs> and he never called it a program. He called it a prog. So he'd say, Tone, welcome to the prog. And then Tony would say, well, now, Spanish onions are in your supermarket today. They're a great buy. And 
two and or in all money, two and sixpence a, a bag, and, and they talk for fifteen minutes about vegetables. Yeah, and and there's about two million people listening to this, right? So I thought I, I'm not interested in vegetables, mm. and I don't know anybody who could do it, even if I was. But I am interested in film, and I know a guy who can do it for me. So I ring Philip Malloy, he was the film critic for the Irish Independent, and I said, Philip, do you want to come on the radio? And we used to do movies every week. Mm. Uh, and all we did was talk about movies and, and huge numbers of people. And then when I lived in America, there's only right-wing radio in, in America. There's no liberal radio. Mm. There's a famous guy called Rush Lumbaugh who had literally tens of millions listening mm. to him. And I said, I gotta get one of these guys. And then I trawled around the internet and I found this guy, Michael Graham. And and he was a right wing radio guy in uh, Washington, DC. Mm. And he came on the show every week. And there was nobody like him on Irish radio. Mm. There was no uh, raving Republican, <laughs> you know, on Irish radio. And suddenly he and I are going hammer and tongs every Thursday. And, and People ring up and say, I hate that American, and he's terrible. Mm. <laughs> but they listen, so it doesn't matter. You know, and then everybody travels. Mm. So I got a travel guy. And I copied all that. None of that was my idea, if you like. Mm. I copied the idea from essentially Jimmy Young and Tony D'Angelo. Mm. And then I copied the lovely Ingrid from all those old comedians of a hundred years ago. Mm. And then the other thing I did was I prepared. So I, I, uh, I, I would go in early, radio or television, but you asked about radio and I'd, I'd prepare and I'd think about it like. So I never had notes really. Mm. Now, how do you do an interview without notes? I'm always amused when I'm on to watch television now, current affairs, and they all have a card in their hand mm. with the questions written on them, right? Now, what I did, I my first question was the same for everybody, just a variation, but it was mm. the same question, because the great Dunphy, famously said one time, it's not about what the presenter knows, it's what the guest knows. So my opening question was, what's this all about then? Mm. Or some variation. Mm. Mm. And then the guy said, well, it's about a cure for cancer. So now what's the second question? The second question is really, that's fantastic. I know nothing about cancer, explain. Mm. Because the, the listener at home doesn't know either. Mm. So you're there representing the listener. So, so what kind of a question would he ask or she ask? And that's all the time what you're thinking about. In the back of your head, I had a person. Uh, Terry Wogan, when he retired, thanked one person, the person who listened to him. Right? <laughs> one person. And there's millions. There's been talks about one. Um, the Gaelic correspondent, the Irish Times, told me that he used to write for an old lady in Mayo. You know, when he was writing his column, he was thinking about her. Mm. So I used to think of this person in a car, going home from work, don't know whether it's male, female, don't know what age it is, but I know they've had a hard day at the office and they want me to bring them home. Mm. So that's all I did. I, I, I tried to ask the questions they wanted to ask. Mm. And also like whether I was smart about it or not, I asked the questions that, you know, explain to me, you're the expert, explain mm. to me. It doesn't matter ultimately whether it's, it's Sinn Féin or it's a professor of medicine, the questions are the same. You're just simply saying why, what, where, and when, mm. which is like the first thing a newspaper journalist learns. The editor, a, a raw journalist, on his first day in the office, he is told in the first paragraph, I want to know where, what, how, and when. Mm. That's all I did. So it wasn't very difficult. Mm.